presidential libraries are living institutions. Certainly it is my hope that the Reagan Library will become a dynamic intellectual forum where scholars interpret the past and policymakers debate the future. Welcome to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute's virtual event series. To fulfill President Reagan's mission of making the Reagan Library a dynamic intellectual forum, our Center for Public Affairs Programming offers lectures and forums presenting perspectives on important public policy issues of the day. Each year we bring you 20 to 30 events from politicians, authors, members of the media, business and military leaders, and more. During the 2020 closure of many businesses across our great country due to COVID-19, the Reagan Foundation switched to virtual programming to ensure that we were still delivering world-class content, even if you couldn't get to our hilltop to watch it in person. Now that the Reagan Library Museum is back open, we are holding hybrid programming, whereby some are in person and some are virtual. We hope you enjoyed this virtual event. In this Center for Public Affairs virtual event, we bring you successful entrepreneur, venture capitalist, and Reagan Foundation trustee, Joe Lonsdale. Joe Lonsdale is co-founder and managing partner at APC, a US-based venture capital firm, which manages some 4 billion US dollars. He was an early institutional investor in many notable companies, including Wish, Oculus, Flexport, Joby Aviation, and many others. Mr. Lonsdale has been on the Forbes 100 minus list since 2016, and was the youngest member included in 2016 2017. Mr. Lonsdale began his career as an early executive at Clarion Capital, which he helped to grow into a large global macro hedge fund. He also worked with PayPal's computer scientist from college. He received a BS in computer science from Stanford in 2003 and often lectures and writes on entrepreneurship, technology, and public policy. In this conversation with Reagan Institute Washington Director Roger Zakheim, Mr. Lonsdale discusses his political philosophy and mentors, his work in venture capital, technological competition with China, the need for innovation in the defense sector, and the political rights conflict with Big Ten. We hope you enjoy the conversation. Joe Lonsdale, welcome to Reaganism. Thanks for having me, Roger. Well, a lot of people know you, your public pro profile as a leader in the tech industry, uh, some you know, real significant startups that have succeeded and the like are associated with your name. Others may not be aware that you are a Ronald Reagan enthusiast. Uh, and uh, recently you were added to the board of trustees for the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation Institute, which is great for me. I get to interact with you. Tell us a little bit why Reagan's legacy is important to you. Well, it's uh, it definitely was an honor to be added to the board. I think I'm the youngest by about 20 years. <laughs> right now. But, uh, hey, it's nice for me to interact with somebody who's, uh, you know, similar generation. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know our generation is allowed to do this. You know, you know, I mean, Ronald Reagan represents a lot of really important things for our country. He really believed in our country. He really believed in the principles of the founding of our country of freedom. And, you know, the, I, think, I think our country right now, uh, there's a lot of pessimism we're seeing. And I think it, it's just a lot of echoes into the late seventies, right? Where, where there's just people thinking that America's days are over. It was no longer the great country. It's no longer going to be, continue to be great. And in, in Reagan said, no, that's just completely wrong. If we embrace these values and we stand up for it. And he communicated his passion and belief in these values. He was a happy warrior who was able to, who was able to kind of get people excited again about what it meant to be American. And, and, and you know, obviously no, no, no individual is perfect, but he was really, really extraordinary in the values he brought to bear and the risks he took and the courage he took in, in, in putting these things back into America. Yeah, I like that risk, courage, but you start off with this optimism, this person who came in at a time where Americans are feeling down. And I think uh, a big part of what Reaganites say when they reflect on Reagan's time in, in office was restored the pride in the country. Uh, it sounds like you're up to doing a little bit of that in your own world. We're going to have a competing podcast, apparently. Uh, you're about to launch one. Tell us about that. Well, yeah, we, we're, we're calling it American Optimist. Uh, there's so much stuff that I get to be exposed to in my work in the technology world, where there's all these diseases being cured. There's all these, you know, new technologies being created that are changing our world for the better. And, and you know, in my, I work in the policy world. I have about 20 full-time people that are drafting and passing legislation. We try to keep it nonpartisan, but it takes what's working in our free society and applies it to areas we've accidentally broken that are hurting the least fall well off, whether it's with criminal justice, whether it's with how healthcare works, whether it's with education. There's all these ways you can improve these areas. And so I think it's just really... It's fun and inspiring to teach people. Actually, our country not only is pretty great, but there are problems and there are good solutions to these problems that, using the values of our country. 
So we're going to talk about that later in the conversation and your work at the uh, Cicero Institute and, and, and your approach, which seems so, so interesting in terms of working at the state level. But before we get to what you're doing today, I want to get back a little bit to your, your personal story. Um, Stanford, uh, you know, we are one of those people that people think about where, you know, a successful entrepreneur coming out of Stanford and Silicon Valley. Uh, but political philosophy was a big part of your time there and, and, and your focus and your involvement in the Stanford Review. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, I did, I guess you'd say both computer science and, and political philosophy and economics. I was lucky when I was there, actually, Milton Friedman was at Hoover. He, he and his wife Rose would have lunch with us a lot. And there's just, there's obviously just a lot of resources there to, 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 to study and understand and debate these different ideas. The Stanford Review is sort of the contrarian newspaper. You have people with all sorts of views but it was basically contrarian to the dominant kind of neoliberal, you know, views on campus at that time and increasingly progressive views on campus at that time. And, you know, I, I, I think, I think you basically were kind of under siege even then at Stanford, if you believe that markets can lift up the lives of lots of people. And if you believe that the solutions to our problems can be found in the values of a free society. So it was, it was good to have a small group of people. And you know, what's amazing is a lot of these people who ran the Stanford review and who continue to run it over the next decade, uh, do, in order to do that, you had to kind of be contrarian and think for yourself. A lot of them ended up being some of the very most successful entrepreneurs over the next period. So, so there's a huge number of people who have actually built things successfully coming from that group of talented people who thought differently. Fascinating. Um, you, you kind of classify the culture on campus when you were there, neoliberal, progressive. Uh, I take it you're more of a classical liberal. Did you arrive at Stanford Kind of with these thoughts and intentions in mind, or was it your kind of reaction to an environment standing for that, that, that the, you know, I, 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 my, my younger brother, my younger brother, actually younger brother, my younger brother, Jeff got me to read a lot of Austrian ec economics and a, and a lot of just, you know, we even went von Mises and Rothbard and all this stuff and all the anarcho-capitalist stuff as a teenager. So it was really good to have that framing and that background. And I, I arrived probably slightly more ideological. I think teenagers in general, are ideological, you have oversimplified views of the world. And my, my ideology was, 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 was very extreme libertarian, probably as a 17, 18, 19 year old. And I'd say I'm more of a realist now. One, one thing that changed over the years and even at Stanford was you actually, you know, negative liberty is a negative philosophy. And it's true. A lot of times there's all these dumb things you break if you don't appreciate like the richness and diversity of how society works bottom up. And, and so, but, but having built a lot of things in the world, I'm really interested in liberty as a positive philosophy. I'm interested in, in, and actually, how do you take the things that are broken in our society and how do you tweak them in a way that understands liberty, understands a free society, that understands transparency, accountability, incentives, and allows people to solve problems? Give me a concrete example. Of that. I mean, I get that theoretically, but tell me how that moves. Yes, yeah, so the, the concrete example, I was, and I, was, I was kind of talking with Charles Koch about this the other day because he's done a great job of, of like the negative side of it, like stopping bad things. But, but if you want to actually do good things, so one, one example is how do you fund, uh, you know, vocational education or te technical schools. So Texas technical schools uh, had basically no accountability as of seven or eight years ago. They just taught whatever they wanted. And some of them kids came out and did really well. And some of them kids came out and you know were more likely to go on welfare or become a Black Lives Matter protester because they didn't have a job and they were angry at the world. And so how do you change this? How do you put accountability in? Well, the obvious, the, the, the dumb way to put accountability, I'll tell you the two dumb ways to put accountability in is to like be like a Soviet, this be like Soviet Union. And everyone, conservatives too, fall into this math. The Soviet Union solution is, we're gonna tell you how to do your course with Charlie. We're gonna tell you what to teach. We're gonna tell you, here's the things that are gonna work. And, and, and that's not how the world works. You can't just impose bureaucracy top down with the right answers. I mean, AEI, which I love is a free enterprise institute, always tries to do this and it's wrong. You can't impose things top down. Uh, you can't just say, here's a graduation rate. I mean, that's a good start to try having a high graduation rate, but guess what? They'll change the rules and they'll graduate people who didn't deserve to graduate. So the only thing you could do is you can set up transparency and accountability to think to market forces they can't control. What's the market force that matters for vocational school, for technical schools? It's the salaries of the students coming out. So you know, you know what they did is seven years ago, they passed a law in Texas, where my, my new home state, and they said, the funding of our technical schools will be tied based on the average salary coming out three years of students going to these schools. And so the schools responded by saying, oh, we have to teach skills to get people good jobs. And you know what? The salaries have more than doubled coming out of Texas technical schools over the last seven years. Again, the right metrics. Really. That's what you do in a business to make sure you're truly going to succeed. And that's it's what, it's what you do in business. So, so we're taking this thing that we know works in our free society and we're applying it 
to this thing that's currently broken because the government wasn't reflecting a free society. We made it reflect a free society and it worked. And then there's tons of areas where this works. So a, a real insight into a, a way to go about public policy. Uh, before we leave your, your kind of rearing and intellectual rearing, one other relationship I know you had, I'd love for you to uh, discuss, George Schultz. Tell me about your connection to George Schultz and, and Se Se Secretary how he impacted Schultz, your thinking. Secretary approach. Schultz was a, was, a, was a great man. It was a huge loss. I was actually really sad. The day before our fir my first Reagan board meeting I was going to join, I found out he'd passed uh, after his 100th birthday. And, uh, but he, you know, he was obviously at Hoover for a long time and I got to interact with him a lot. There's a lot of stories he told over the years, a lot of different feedback. Um, you know, I, I'd say some of the ones that, that really affected me the most is when, is when a couple of things were very Reagan-esque. One is like, you know, it doesn't matter who gets the credit. It just matters you get something done. And, 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 uh, and, and it also, it's like, you have to make people think it's their idea. That's like part of that, right? So like one of these stories he would tell me is he'd go to Tip O'Neill and get him, you know, the Democratic leader of the on the, you know, in the 80s, and and get him to think this like closing these tax loopholes were his idea and is really and he could negotiate. And then he'd go to Reagan and say the only way we're you know going to lower these taxes anymore is if you close all these loopholes and we do it in a revenue neutral way. And so the Democrats will love it. And so Reagan and and, and just what you want to do, Mr. President. And he kind of get both of them convinced it was their idea. And then he'd help both of them draft it up. And then he'd like. Bring, and then you bring it together. And like, you, you know, what's amazing is like this, there's a tax bill he got passed this way that he came up with, obviously. <laughs> you know, he didn't take credit for it, but he came up with it and it passed with 97 votes in the Senate. Gotcha. Which is, it's extraordinary. Like coming, to, coming up with something, <laughs> passing with 97, you can't even imagine that today, right? It's just, it's, just, it's just legendary. So, and obviously America was a little less polarized back then, but still it's just so impressive. I don't know, it was pretty polarized then. I think when you learn history, right? You, you tend to feel better about uh, where you live now because you see how how divisive things were in the that, past. that's fair things were divisive then and they're, they're even more divisive at different times but but yeah the, the 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 ability of people like him to get things done to get people to work together to work in the background without taking credit there's just it really gave me like just kind of a sense of duty that, that this you know it's it's it, it, it's, okay. it's helpful sometimes people know you're doing good things but it, you, you get a lot more done just working in the background and giving credit to everyone else last one and we'll go to more policy items but look connect the dots for me because we've talked about you know, Freeman, you talk about Schultz, but another person that really impacted you, as I understand it, based on our conversations around this time and, and leaving Stanford was Peter Thiel. Connect the dots between a George Schultz and Peter, Peter Thiel and, uh, and, and, and your kind of trajectory. Yeah, and Peter's probably the highest IQ person I've worked with. He's an intellectual, he's an outsider. He's, uh, he thinks for himself. He, he'll, you know, when you think for yourself in these ways, you can sometimes veer into it areas where you, you make bad mistakes, but you also vary in areas where you're way ahead of everyone else and you're doing genius things and figuring things out way ahead of time. Um, you know, actually I wrote, I wrote a, at one point, uh, uh, this, you know, lessons I learned from Peter Thiel, you search for online, but I think, I think the most important, and there's a lot of those that are pretty good. There's nine of them, but the most important one I'd say that I listed at the end of that is it's really important to keep going back to first principles and, and then acting quickly on new conclusions. And so it's, it, in some ways it's a little bit scary because you're kind of, you're constantly questioning everything. But another way is just like you're being intellectually honest. And you're saying what is the core here, and 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 you know, and what what's the, what's the foundation of what we're doing? What what's the thing that's most important that matters? Most people will say, well, there's six reasons why we're doing this, and that's actually just sloppy thinking. And Peter really taught me to go down like what is the what's the core reason? Like what's the actual in, in, the, in the world? There tends to be a dominant variable, and are we aligned with that dominant variable? And 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 so just just constantly questioning, going back to first principles, acting quickly. If it points to new directions, taking time to talk to people with whom you disagree in order to reevaluate these. I mean, those are those are those are lessons I saw that, that really really changed how I operated. Uh, so Peter Thiel, you, uh, I, in my, from my uh, sense, really got on the map uh, with Palantir. Obviously, that's in the rearview mirror for you. You've done a lot since then. I'm, I'm, I'm a proud I'm a proud advisor to Palantir. I know did you see my tweet on Carp this week. It's pretty. I did not see it. Tell me. A lot of people don't realize. Our co so so Alex Carp. Uh, was an old friend of Peter's who was helping us out at the hedge fund when I was working with Peter. And, just, and he was also the, he was a top philosophy student of Habermas, the top philosopher in Europe at the time. And all these billionaires like to pretend to be philosophers. So he got to know a bunch of them and he was helping out here. And since this, that's European culture, uh, it's not so bad. It, it, it's uh, it's better than all the billionaires hanging out with the sports stars here, right? So, so it's different, <laughs> different, different cultures, but you know, he, he was helping him, Peter raise money and I got to know him really well. And long story short, I convinced him to become co-founder and CEO of Palantir as we were building it out. And, uh, and, he, and he turned out to be, you know, even the rest of us were computer scientists who were founder, the other founder, Stefan and I and Nathan, and then Peter and Carp were kind of like philosophers. And so it's a motley crew. 
And he turned out to be an amazing CEO. He never run anything like this in his life. Right. 18 years later, he's still running it. Uh, a lot of people don't realize actually he has a, his mother is African-American. So his father's Jewish. His mother, his mother is a black woman. And, uh, and what's really cool is, is this article came out attacking him saying he was the best paid CEO in That's America right. last year. So if people don't realize there's like a, you know, the son of a black woman was the best paid CEO in America last year, which, which, which I, which I kind of caused. So it's at a point of pride for me there. <laughs> it, it, it tends to get overlooked, right? Convenient arguments or, or not arguments. Uh, it would, with Palantir, I mean, someone, you know, my background, uh, you know, inside the Beltway, national security interested professional, you brought in almost a revolution with Palantir, you know, I'd say Palantir and SpaceX in terms of really trying to take the Silicon Valley, tech disruption uh, into the world of, of national security. Yeah, Pal Pal Palantir was kind of able, as was with SpaceX, kind of able to show the emperor has no clothes, right? Tell us more about that. But before you do, in terms of what those companies did, that's covered, but I want to get your gloss on it. But kind of what brought you and that group of people interested in going into national security? Was that ideological value-based or a market opportunity or both? You know, I, I did grow up watching Reagan and and hearing the stories about how he was going to fight the bad guys and stop the bad guys and you know the, the whole cold war my, my my father was a big reagan fan so i was i was born in 82 so i was i, I remember sitting and watching tv and, and cheering for the good guy good guy on tv and talking about the bad guys and where the bad guys live and, and so i'm sure there's some there's there's definitely a sense of patriotism in me and this and this instinct that we have to fight for our country that was definitely given to me by my father and his father before him and, and it's just it's, so this is definitely a noble ideal in fighting for the country and especially given the, that we believe in the values of our country. Um, and, uh, you know, there's also this, this sense I have where I just hate when things are really broken and stupid. And, and so, you know, being, you know, being a PayPal with, with Peter as, as a kid and kind of watching as, as, we, as we had to fight the Chinese and Russian mafia and then, and then getting to know a lot of people in Secret Service and FBI who had to help us arrest them. They knew nothing about this stuff and we'd teach them and they'd come back to us and we'd teach them how to deal things other areas. And then after, and then after and then seeing 9-11, seeing how broken the systems were and then seeing the government spend billions and billions of dollars uh, on, on just like really backwards technology, stuff that was just, we never even considered doing things that way in the year 2000 or 1999 or 2001 in Silicon Valley. It was stuff that the way things were done in the 70s and 80s basically, or even worse, right, with the wrong incentives, the wrong setup. So it was just horrifying seeing the government waste billions of dollars after 9-11 and knowing there's bad guys out there trying to get, trying to get us and that we're doing this horribly. So that there was like, there was a huge motivation, like, wow, we have to fix this. We, we happen to be in this part of the world to have the best technology in the world to fix this, to help the government collaborate and protect civil liberties and identify and find the terrorists and stop them. And so let's take our smartest friends, let's go in there and let's fix it. I remember being a young staffer on Capitol Hill, the first time I had a Silicon Valley software company talk to me, and I wasn't a program person per se, it was Palantir. And, and wow. it, it was like, software doesn't have to be hard software doesn't, you know, it should make things easier. And, and, and they did that demo. I can still remember it sitting in the Rayburn house office building. They have the red blinking lights. I remember there are a few of them where they could do that. Yeah. And it was like, okay, you know, no, it was actually showing how they can network, how they could discover the network. Yeah. The network um, versus the network Vega. was the key, key understanding that network theory, network data. Exactly. And it was, it was, it was just, just worlds apart from anything I'd seen before. Um, but you've worked on other things since what's the next frontier for you, Joe, and kind of, your cohort in terms of what needs to happen to truly integrate national security with the best innovation coming out of this country. So, so Palmer Lucky and some of my colleagues from Palantir founded Andrel, which means a store that defends the West. And so, you know, after Palantir, I built a lot of other companies, spent a lot of time. I run one of the big investment firms, venture capital. And ABC, uh, right? That's ABC, exactly. And we, we do a lot in logistics and healthcare, the revolution in bio, and there's all these cool things going on. And you know, and I and I, you know, I take a dumb pound here. It's doing great things. We helped eliminate 9,000 terrorists. We helped save the government tens of billions of dollars, protect civil liberties. I'm like, okay, but it's kind of like a check. You're done with that part of your life, and you're going on. And I'm working on other things. And then I saw how Maven at Google, this Project Maven that Google is working on, because Google is like the top AI in our country. They, ref they refuse to help the DoD anymore. And then basically, the progressive left won within these countries. And they said, so this is Project Maven. Just for everybody, this is where Google employees said, we don't want to support. Uh, with AI and, and algorithms to help target terrorists. And it kind of put Google, they put a pause in it. Maybe they're back to doing it now, but it was that moment where people thought tech was turning its back on national security. 
Yeah, and I think they're still not fully back in the way they could be. But but it was basically like there's these like five or ten percent of these companies are full of these really far left progressives who scream the loudest, and therefore they stop the companies from from helping. You know, and it just became really clear that that this was a big problem. And it was and it was that's kind of reminding me to go look at it again. And I said, wow, you know, and we track the top talent. Like we're we're one of the top venture capital firms. We know you know just like when you're if you're like a, if you're like building a college football team, you know who the top talent is for college football. We talk, track the top tech talent out of the top schools, out of the top companies. And we realized basically none of the top computer science talent was working in the government anymore in the last 15 years. Like, it's not just like a few, we're like, oh, pretty much none are working, not just the government. None. But they, You're but meaning like, nobody's like motivated illogically, I want to go into NSA. You know, no, the few people will go in and they go out right away because they'd be disgusted because they wouldn't be allowed to do things the right way. They'd be managed by idiots. They'd be stuck in a basement. And it's like- Trey Stevens uh, story. The top technologists are artists. They want to be around the other great artists. Like even if they're motivated and dutiful, they're not going to like sit there and, and melt in a basement where they're not allowed to do things properly. They're going to go where their skills are used, where they're paid five times as much to do things better, right? So, and, and it's not just the government. It's like all the defense contractors, the more we look at them, the more it's like 98% of what they're doing is innovation theater. They're very good at pretending to innovate so they can get staffers to give them money, but they're not very good at actually innovating and actually doing things in, in, in courageous and bold and, and new new ways. And that and that and that really scared me because I, I see China and China has a lot of top talent these days. It has, you know, it, it has, the Beijing is 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 just as good in many ways. There's, there's a lot of things going on in Silicon Valley in a lot of areas. It's no longer the case that China is like weak and copying us. There's a lot of people in my father's generation that remember the Soviets and they're like, well, China's probably just lying and it's all fake and there's nothing there. And that, that's unfortunately not true. Like Deng Xiaoping, it's real. It's real. It's real. Deng Xiaoping that was mentored by Lee Kuan Yew. Secretary Schultz introduced me to Lee Kuan Yew at one point, and actually, and so he's another hero of mine. And Lee Kuan Yew taught Deng Xiaoping that markets work. He made him read Milton Friedman in China, opened up, and, and they and they do have as much as they're still like a bad communist country with some really problematic values. It, it's very real what's going on there in their markets and the people building things. Like they may, you may become a billionaire, and they may just kill you and take away your wealth. But you get to the billionaire point by doing the same things we do, and so and so it's a real thing. And and they take their top technologists and they work on defense. And so their defense is really growing. And, and it used to, again the 1950s is like oh we have a lot more money we spend more money we're stronger we're now more tanks and more planes, and that's not how the world works right now. The world works in very asymmetric ways right now. We're very small numbers of people in business as well can ma can massively outperform really advanced people right and so so it's a huge problem that we don't have our best and brightest uh incentivized culturally or financially to work on these problems and so he said wow we need to get back in and build some defense companies and so palmer started this with trade trades with my, one of my friends from palantir and worked right. with peter teal and they started andrel uh i i got more involved looked at a bunch of the problems and we took some of our smartest friends we started eparis which is now the, the leading electromagnetic pulse company in the world and tell me about eparis because this is the emp focus right yeah so it turns out yeah, so EMP is this thing you fire, it fires microwave radiation, it takes out electronics from far away, right? So you want, you could actually like, is this gallium nitride, it's a missing material, and it turns out that you have to put all these AI on these on these microchips in order to direct how the power flows in order for it to fire much, much better. And so it turns out, so these big defense primes spent billions of dollars on theirs, and we spent tens of millions on ours with smarter people, and ours are like way better right now. So we're gonna, so like they're all have to partner with us now. And you're doing all this just just to get a sense of kind of the 8VC way and the entrepreneurial entrepreneur way. You're doing this because you're basically placing a bet that you can do it better and cheaper even before the government kind of invests in you. Do I get that? Do I have that? Yeah, no, that, 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 that's right. We 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 put tens of millions of dollars to work on our end before the government gives us much at all. Um, just because we say, you know what, we have a better way of doing this. It's smarter. And, uh, and it's, it's, I mean, what you look for in the world of entrepreneurship is you look for conceptual gaps. You say, wow, the gap between what exists here and what's possible is huge. We're going to go take the smartest people in the world who are the most talented. We're going to hire whoever the best people are in these areas and give them a piece of what we're building. And we're going to draw, take bold risks. And we're going to drive towards filling that gap. And we're going to convince people this is obviously better. And you're going to shame them into working with you because it's stupid what they're doing. And, and that's there's a couple examples where that's worked so and far. And this is this has worked out tens of times for me. Yes. And, and even out. if they don't, you can right. litigate and convince them that you know they're they're not they're not following common sense, which has been the pathway. I mean, you don't even most. Of the, I mean, the litigation is like the last resort of like incompetent business development. Like you, the, you, you yeah, you litigate it verbally, where you just go ex teach them, explain it to them. I think I think Epris has like a former Secretary of Defense Esper on the board, and the guys running it used to help run a lot of big things in D.C. And and I'm just you know I'm really proud of what 
that company's achieved and what's achieving for America. And it's, it's really cool. I mean, it's, you take the next generation of that technology. I don't even know if Trump, Trump's supposed to talk about with these things, but you can imagine miles of range. And, you know, any car or truck after 1979 needs its chips to run. Any ship needs its chips, chips to run. So you can take out pretty much any vehicle, any drone at a great distance without hurting any people at all. So it's, it's yeah, pretty cool. I mean, that's, there was a, a member of Congress uh, who's now retired named Roscoe Bartlett. Joe, I don't know if you've heard of Roscoe Bartlett from Maryland. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, he, uh, if you, if you go on, if you, if you Google him, he will not look like uh, an innovator based on the way he looks in the, in the Google, you know, images. But this person had been focusing on EMPs forever. He's a, he was a six scientist and, and for a long time, he pushed something called an EMP commission to look at these issues. Now, I'm not certain whether they looked at the right ones or the wrong ones, but he was a member of Congress who suddenly understood the power of what you're describing. Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, fa it's a fascinating area. And I think, I think because of new advances with gallium nitride and with, and with how you can manage p power, there's all sorts of things that are possible here that weren't before. So it's, it's, a, it's a great thing for our country. I want to go back to China in a minute uh, and get a reaction to a question from our survey, but one more in terms of innovation. Uh, your friend and, and, and mentor Peter Thiel has said that the U.S. is too focused and the tech community too focused on, let's say, software. More has to be done on the hardware front. Um, what's your take on that? And specifically, uh, the Reagan Institute is working on manufacturing in the United States and, and too much reliance on manufacturing in China uh, or places in Asia, which uh, creates vulnerability uh, for national security community semiconductors is the most prominent and perhaps most important example. Uh, what's your thinking on, on, on manufacturing in the United States? And if you have thoughts on, on semis, you're just talking about automobiles. I mean, you know, I can't get a, a new lease right now or a new car. Uh, because no, we're short, short of the goddamn ship. It's, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, you know, software is a really awesome field and I'm glad it's what I studied because there's just infinite intellectual leverage in fixing any kind of process with software and information. I mean, ultimately, you know, we don't know how we don't know how to build human brain yet, nor will we for a very long time. But you can build all sorts of interesting, you know, conceptual things in software. So, so software is the most important for entrepreneurship and will be for a long time. I think Peter was right that there is a pretty big gap that developed in hardware because so much talent was focusing on software, and because of all the cool new possibilities there. Epris is one example we just talked about where yeah. where you by 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 using these these microchips in new ways and using electronic warfare in new ways. There's all these hardware, but even the hardware there, you're using a hardware software solution. So it's, it's really you're working on both hardware and software. Uh, you know, ma manufacturing. You know, I, I started a company with Bob Nelson and my team last year. Bob Nelson's a multi-billionaire biotech guy. Where at the beginning of the pandemic last year, we started an advanced biomanufacturing company. We brought on a bunch of talent to manufacture here because we were really worried the U.S. didn't have enough manufacturing in these areas. If you looked at this was March of the beginning of the pandemic, sure. and uh, Bob knew before any of my friends, he was telling me in January what a big deal this was going to be. And it was pretty obvious that like there, there could be some solutions that involve some of this new revolution of bio that we're involved in. So we we were basically bought a bunch of plants and equipped them to produce mRNA, gene therapy, and cell therapy. And obviously that ended up being a very useful thing to do, uh, you know, early last year. We're all and, benefiting uh, from the vaccines that use that. Yeah. And so uh, it's just definitely been involved in a bunch of related efforts there. And it's, and it's, and it's, it's actually, it's really cool because it, it, it turns out, you know, it, it turns out that you, we've hired thousands of people and it's actually very profitable to own the production of these things here. There's tons of new ideas right now in gene therapy and cell therapy. Well, someone will come to me and say, Joe, you know, there's 30,000 people who have this one mutation. And if we do this single, you know, monogeneic, change like one little change basically you can you can help all these people and it's going to be 120 million dollars for my phase one to manufacture it and, and, and can you give me the 120 million I think, well it's a lot of money for a for this thing and, and you want to help these things but there's a lot of ideas like that right now so but by building this manufacturing plant they could do it much more cheaply now they can only go raise 10 million dollars to try out the phase one and they can partner and share the ip and that becomes a lot more doable you can do a lot more of these faster you know? just to slow that down if i understand you correctly if you invest in manufacturing, you bring the cost down. Isn't that counterintuitive to what it, most people think about manufacturing in the United States? Well, yeah, if you invest in manufacturing, you bring the cost down because you have like this massive scale and massive expertise in one place. And so people don't, don't have to all go rebuild it themselves. So it kind of, it's kind of like building an AWS. AWS is Amazon's you know, infrastructure for running things in the cloud. Like building, this is called Resilience Bio. It's kind of like an AWS for manufacturing some different types of mRNA and, and gene therapies and cell therapies, which are these new things that are able to be applied in, in, in pretty impressive ways. Well, what I like about that is it actually is consistent with market principles, right? That you would manufacture here because it's better for, you know, kind of improving quality, bringing down costs and, and, and the like. 
what you're thinking about other types of manufacturing that we might need to have government involvement uh, to spur investment and funding, but from a, if you let the market operate on its own, like semiconductors, you find the manufacturing resides elsewhere. You know, I think people are starting to realize that there is a gap in the semiconductor area, and I think the market is going after that. I, I, I guess for national security purposes, I don't mind the government just saying that we're going to buy X, Y, and Z to the tune of 50 billion or 100 billion or whatever it is, and whoever produces it best and cheapest, we're going to buy that because that creates like a promise to the market and gets the market to be able to build against that and be able to raise money against that. I think that's that's like a functional thing for the defense department to do. What's dysfunctional is to decide which of their friends they're going to give grants to to build things. And what you see with crony capitalism and with and with this industrial policy the last 60 years is that you've basically consistently wasted and lost money whenever the government does these things, whether it's with the with the bad nuclear stuff in the 80s, whether it's with the Concord stuff they're trying to do here. It's just there's just this naive strain on the right of status that, that, that they want to be like a mini Soviet Union and they want to decide top down how things should work. And, and whenever you do that, you end up wasting money and you end up rewarding connected people. And right now, I'm doing a great job building all these things, investing in all these things. If the government does this, and especially in areas I'm working in, it becomes my job to have to fly to D.C. and pay off all these people and hire all these people and try to get that money for myself. And, and the government loves this because they want me to have to fly to D.C. and spend all this money. Right. And but this is not a good thing. It's a horrible thing. And the but right how do we get around that? You know, use the language of crony capitalism. Uh, but when government has, you know, decided that it makes sense to invest in a certain area, you know, let's talk about fifty billion dollars semiconductors or seven hundred you know, plus it, billion it, dollars it, annually. It if they want to, if they want to be a customer to that area, that is that's ethically acceptable. It's ethically unacceptable, and it's stupid, and it's wrong, and it's going to cause problems if they're going to invest in the area because they're going to basically reward people who are connected. As opposed, like I'll tell you what, Palantir never got like we got Incutel gave us like two million dollars once, and they never took all the credit for it. That's like a tiny bit of our early money, and like the Palantir never got big grants, never got anything close to the money these other these other companies get because we were the outsiders. The outsiders who are smarter, they don't they're not the ones who get this money. It's always the doofus things tied to like the general from you know some rural state that like knows the right people and and wants to get jobs in his hometown. And that's that's great if we're just going to be doing a jobs program if we're going to manage a jobs program. Right. If, this is, if the point of it is to be a competitive internationally and to advance our economy, that is not what works. It never has, it never will. Have you seen an example where the government has done the following? One, made some investments so it could it can make it a safer bet for the market to participate. And then two, what I hear you describing, also just be a good customer where they're, they're, they're making a competitive environment and giving, uh, 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 purchasing things from, from the best quality uh, product. You know, we're pushing, there, there are some commercial off the shelf purchases that do happen. It's a growing percent, fortunately, procurement, because a lot of the generals have realized how bad the big, the big defense industrial complex companies have gotten. It's still much too small. So I think what we need is procurement reform that forces them to do more commercial off the shelf buying and more purchasing like that. They, they, are, they are doing some of it in like a handful of areas they have to work in. Uh, but, but no, they, they need to do a lot more of that. I, I, I think it's just like this fake thing from people who've never built things themselves who want the government to invest in these things. I think it's actually just, a waste of money and it's crony and, and I, I, I have built so many companies and like they do not want to invest in my new ideas that are good ideas they want me to go do something they've already defined that's stupid in, in, in order to get money and that's it's just frustrating to me that you have people who can never run i mean you, there's, there's tons of i mean roger there's tons of ways people can run 10 billion dollar funds 50 billion dollar funds 100 billion dollar funds there's lots of these funds out there like if you have a good idea for a gap go run a 20 billion dollar fund go start it go convince people start off with a smaller amount prove yourself right and then get the bigger amount like there's market mechanisms for doing this the market mechanisms for doing this should not be going into the government for people who never be confident enough to run a big fund and getting to write these checks is, is a joke one more question on this just to uh continue the debate but we won't resolve it here yep. exhausted i should say commercial on the shelf commercial technologies you know makes sense to me all the innovative stuff that the military needs today for the most part is coming from outside of government, the commercial world, which you, you know, have, have been involved with and, and, and led on, but yep. there are many things that our military needs that the market is just the government market. Right. I mean, yep. you know, no, that, no, that, 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 that's true. Listen, I'm not going to be, I mean, these EMPs, some of them, I guess, all the stadiums, I guess, 
but like a lot of this, like the missiles, if you want 3D print missiles, we're not going to be 3D printing missiles for right aircraft yeah. carriers, fighter aircraft. I wouldn't mind having 3D printed missiles, but that's, that's probably correct to be against the law. I'm not that extreme. <laughs> so, so yeah, and exactly, you probably shouldn't give give Peter Thiel his own aircraft carriers. So, 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 so yeah, no, so you do need you do need some contracting, and so there is this like problem in the defense world where you need contracting, and you and you, you try to make it as competitive as possible. You try to reform it so you accept more outside bids, so you let more people into parts of it. And that's just going to be a constant struggle. It's always going to be somewhat broken, but the more transparent, the more competitive it is, the less you have people like making the decision and then going to work for the big company, probably the, the better, the better these things will work. And so, yeah, there's always going to be some waste and some cronyism, but we got to be really careful of extending that area of waste into all these other parts of the economy is my, is my bias. All right, different time. I got to tell you about a hearing I participated with, with Bernie Sanders on, on this point, but oh, no. Uh, no time for it now. Yeah, you uh, <laughs> find it interesting. Um, I want to go to Cicero Institute and Charter Cities, but before we do, uh, I want to go back to what you you were talking about before with respect to competition with China and how this is decidedly not, you know, the Soviet Union. That they are really uh, innovating. Uh, they, they understand they are technology. For real. Yeah. Yeah. So here's something from our Reagan National Defense Survey that was conducted in 2021, just a few months ago, and we found that 39 percent. And I think only 39% of Americans believe the U.S. military has the best overall technological capabilities in the world, right? So meaning that the majority of Americans think that we don't have the best, right? If only 39% think we do. Um, seems to me, uh, do you agree with that in terms of now this is technological capability? Are we the best or just one of the best, Joe? You know, you have to be careful with these things because I really like the people are waking up and that they're concerned about the fact that even though we spend the most money by far of any military, a lot of that money is spent either as a jobs program or as cronyism. So it's not really spending money on the things that make us competitive. So, so I, I like people are aware of that. I want to confront that. I want to fix that. Now, that said, America still has a pretty extraordinary military. I think we still have some of the best submarines in the world. I think we still have some of the best planes in the world. I think we still have like a lot of parts of what we do is, is, is very, very good. And so like, I, I think I think right now today, you know, it's we're, we're probably still number one. I just think that it's a lot closer. There's a lot of new asymmetric technologies being developed by by Russia, by China, by Iran, by others uh, that, that we're probably not not trying to invest in enough in the right way. What about those technologies that you really built your name around, uh, you know, kind of from artificial intelligence, you know, robotics, autonomy, all these things? Um, are we the best in that? Or, or when you look at China, as you described before, are they out, outdoing us there? You know, I think, I think this is a really dangerous kind of mid 20th century framework that we all use when we talk about things in DC and the government. It's like, it's like there's this, like this one system and the system is AI or the system is quantum and, and, and that has to work. And, I, and I, it's, not really, it's not really how these things work right now. It's like there's a lot of different types of dynamic weapons and systems that use different types of things. And so like, it's like AI is something we use in everything, just like you use steel and everything in the mid 20th right. century. It's not, you know, it's, it's, you're not, you're not going to have like the single best AI. I mean, that is possible to have a general AI. That's, okay, single, but that's look, not how, how to apply. You're right. But like applying it to things that are relevant to national security, integrating it into uh, our, our, our yeah, how, really, really what it would be in my, in my, in my framework is having the, having the dynamic top tech talent, as part of these weapon systems and defense systems and response systems that know how to build using the cutting edge of what's possible with AI in, in, in that dynamic system and, and being able to update it and improve and iterate and test and war game it where the smartest people are wargaming it and then trying again and then getting better. And if you have these cultures in these organizations, you're not gonna, you're not gonna create like a single AI that's integrated and it's done. And now we have this AI thing, you're gonna have a culture that attracts the best technologists that are, that are iterating work on these problems. And the answer is no, we don't have that at all. It's a, it's a huge problem. I've heard you talk elsewhere um, in terms of culture in tech companies, which we'll get to in, in, in just a bit here, uh, and said that you know conservatives or liber you know kind of wherever you want to place yourself in the spectrum, you know classical liberals haven't tried to conquer institutions, right? We're, you know, yes. but, but people, yes, say progressives are very much focused on that. Is anybody trying to conquer the institution of the, of, of of our you know, military industrial complex and, and our military itself? Well, I mean, they seem, I mean, they seem like they're pretty slightly conquered by the woke, at least, or at least they're paying obeisance to it. I thought it was one of the most shameful things I ever saw when two, you know, two former generals on the board of Lockheed 
they both tolerated their company doing critical race theory trading that lambasted white males and made them apologize. And, and this is like, this is a complete emasculation, you know, of this entire company that they would allow that to happen and go along with it. And these guys are fine cutting off their balls for the sake of money, it sounds like, versus being strong leaders in America. It's, it's embarrassing. So yes, yeah, I think, I think these places have been conquered and that will never happen in any defense company I'm involved with. I, I will, I'll, be, I'll be resigning if that ever happens in any kind of defense company I'm involved with. And the fact that they didn't shows that they're like pathetic excuses for leaders in America. But I mean, it, it is what publicly traded companies do to respond to their shareholders, no? No, 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 that's not what they need to do. If you're a man and you're a woman and you're proud of your country and proud of your values, you should not be responding to like stupid, crazy activist shareholders. The same way Google shouldn't have responded to its crazy far left, they're allowed by not helping defend America. These men should not have responded by letting their company be emasculated and go against their values. And so I think it's, I think it's horrifying. Well, perhaps now that we're focusing on, on this set of issues, progressives and classical liberals and, and a lot of what we're seeing in terms of uh, identity politics and, 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 and kind of the social debate, Cicero Institute, um, and just having well, Cicero is not part of the culture war. Like that's fair like, enough. That, yeah. But, but this idea of, of taking kind of classical liberal ideas and applying them um, in, to solve problems in our society, you're yeah, operating. The, the framework of the positive, the positive realist uses of a free, the framework of a free society, right? Let's and there's this is this is something that that I I, I want to inspire a lot more people to help with. Because there's so much low hanging fruit and, and this is this is, is a form of philanthropy this is something where there's just so many areas of our society that are broken and by being broken they're hurting people and they're hurting poor people the most they're hurting people in disadvantaged communities the most right so if you look at i mean look at our prison system i'm not i'm not some kind of bleeding heart person that thinks people shouldn't be punished if someone does a crime they need to be punished and we need to be strong we need to have strong police and strong prisons to punish people now that said if people are going to be going to prisons anyway let's not have them come out and commit more crimes if there's different options for how we treat them there, right? Or if there are people gonna be in probation or parole anyway, let's work on rehabilitation so their communities can be stronger so they can come back and they're more likely to have a job and they're more likely not to go back to prison. And it's, it's fascinating because there's lots of ways when you're in prison or you're on probation that there's programs people have tried that make the recidivism rate go way down. Recidivism is the percent chance you go back to prison, right? There's, there's things that people have tried to make us people don't go back to prison as much. And there's things people have tried such as shock therapy in certain prisons which it turns out you do go to prison more. And, and like the, the, uh, the ethics of shock therapy aside, if, the, if it makes you more likely to have recidivism and go back and commit more crimes, yes. obviously it's a stupid idea and we should stop doing it. Now this is how dumb government is. There's still prisons in our country doing shock therapy because there's no mechanism of accountability for what works and what doesn't work, right? So, so what you need like for, for every, this is an example of state law I wanna work on next year, is you go into these prisons and you, and you, and you have full transparency on all the recidivism and all the prisons in the state and then you use full transparency in what's being tried or not. And then we put an accountability and say, listen, you guys are 25% more going back. You're not doing these good programs. Uh, you got, you know, you're gonna explore, explore yourself what you wanna do, but if your race racism doesn't don't go down, we're gonna change the leader and who's gonna try something else, you know? And, and, and what's, the, what's the response? What's the ability to engage with the state officials and other- You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's tough. I do this in healthcare. I do this, like we talked about earlier in education yeah. areas and and there's a lot of smart people who are on your side, a lot of great governors are on your side. Uh, there's a lot of special interests, especially people running the prisons or probation are like, no way, we're gonna kill us. And it's, and, it, and it's really, you know, they play political games, they're really sketchy, they don't respond, they pretend they're on your side, they try to kill in the background. You get all sorts of calls. Like our team, we have all these lobbyists who are doing this for the right reason. You get all sorts of crazy calls about things people are trying to do. You know, we were working on this homeless accountability, same type of thing, if you're gonna work on homelessness, be accountable of metrics. And all these homeless troops in Arizona started saying, saying Cicero Institute and Joe Lonzo are making money off homeless. And it's just, it's funny. I'm obviously not making any money off homeless. I have nothing to do with that. I'm just trying to pass yeah. laws to, to not waste money in stupid ways, right? And to be accountable how we spend it. And they'll, they'll, but then they'll get confused and they'll attack you. And, but you know, and we, we, we're getting a lot of laws passed. I mean, there's people who are inspired. We're getting, working with us. We're getting, we're working with even some modern Democrats are helping as a lot of Republicans are helping. Uh, the far left tends to agree with us on some of these things because we're trying to help their yeah. constituents. Yeah. But then, they really, the far left's really bad at like, at like stopping the anti cronies. Basically, whenever, whenever there's like a, whenever there's someone who's like gonna, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a historically black college that has 8% graduation rate and it's failing kids and it's gonna be subject, you know, just to one of those rules we're putting in place where it's not gonna get funded as much if they don't get their, get their like performance up. They're, the far left's really bad at holding people accountable. They're holding to that stake, yeah. Right. So, so, so it's like the far left's kind of like a weak ally because they think they wanna work with you. 
but then they, they, they haven't learned yet how to like stop the crook as well so someone, someone just accuse you of being racist just randomly and the frog's like oh we can't help you anymore well, well just, what, just one, one uh thing i think that i uh read about was cicero that was for sure going to make mayors uncomfortable uh is charter cities where you're trying to kind of construct a framework where and you'll explain it where you're kind of competing for citizens tell us about that well this is uh this is the uh, this idea has been around for a long time. So Milton Friedman's grandson, Patrick Friedman, became a friend of mine a long time ago. I introduced him to Peter Thiel. His, his original framework, of course, was, was seasteading, which is like homesteading in the 19th century, but you do it on the ocean. And, and the basic idea is you should be able to, you want to start new jurisdictions to compete in government. I think the ocean thing is a little bit unrealistic for now, though with enough wealth, you could you could do it. But the, but the, but the framework in general is you want competition amongst governments. You want them to have to serve people better. And you want people to be able to opt out. And this is always something we're seeing all over the US right now is that is that competition playing out. And so the, the more you could have, the more you could have new places to compete and have better frameworks and the more other places will have to be we'll learn from that. And like, like competition makes everyone better, right? The way a free society works is you have a business that innovates. Like Oscar innovated in health insurance when I was working on it with, with Josh Kushner and these guys and Mario. And then all these other health insurance companies responded, united all of a sudden, did a bunch of the things we did because they had to to compete. So, so it lifts everyone if you have new governments that do things in better ways. I mean, Texas has been doing that, right? Isn't that in part explain your move from California to Texas? Texas is doing it. Florida has been doing it. There's just a lot of places, there's a lot of people who worked very hard the last 30 years in Texas to fix the tort law here, to make sure the government wasn't as wasteful. There's, I mean, listen, there's mistakes in every government. There's cronyism in Texas. There's problems everywhere. But I think Texas overall is a lot better. And so so better. what I hear from that is no no regrets for the move. Uh, it's been no, we're well, like it. We're loving it. We're, we're we're loving it here. I mean, I I, you know, I like to tell people the General Grant quote, of course. So he's you know he used to say after his campaigns down here that if he owned hell in Texas, then during the summer he'd live in hell and rent out Texas. <laughs> <laughs> I never heard that. That's great. I may I may um, I may I may I may not. We may we may remodel the house during the summer and, and go visit <laughs> other places. That's great. All right. Well, we can't let you go. Uh, before we do two things, we'll get to our Reagan lightning round, but before we do it, we got to engage you on uh, kind of a thread we, we hit on earlier, but big tech uh, and woke big tech and progressivism and, and how it's playing out, particularly in the Congress. Um, you know, you've been out there talking about how conservatives should or should not uh, be holding uh, companies like Facebook accountable. Let me read you a quote from uh, Senator Josh Hawley and get your reaction to it. Of course, he's probably the one of the uh, most vocal critics of the uh, of tech from on, on the right. This is what he said in April. Woke big tech companies, and he throws out a couple of examples, have been coddled by Washington politicians for years. This treatment has allowed them to amass colossal amounts of power that they use to censor political opinions they don't agree with and shut out competitors who offer consumers an alternative to the status quo. It's past time to, quote, bust up big tech companies, restore competition, and give the power back to the American consumers. What do you think of Senator Hawley's statement there? So Senator Hawley is obviously a bright guy. He's channeling a form of populism that's not how Ronald Reagan or how our founders would approach these things. It's basically this idea that both sides are just fighting and using their power to do whatever they want. And his side, he wants one side to use power to do something, and someone else wants to use power to do something else. And that's a really unhealthy way to approach politics in our society. This is not purely a power game. This is a game where there's principles, there's underlying principles, there are positive some principles that if we follow them and if we follow the constitution, then all of us win. And if we don't follow the constitution and we just have fights however we want, all of us don't win. So the, 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 he's, he's right that there's lots of issues with big tech. You know, I think he was very insightful when he talked about how a lot of what the big tech does is like a drug, basically. There is like dopamine receptors that the big techs figured out how to give you a drug like addiction to certain things right yeah, we all got to be on there we all and, and give all us have to be also, he, so he's, he's right to identify that and to say that maybe there should be laws about that and against or against against that or, or maybe there's ways of addressing that i think he's right I, I think he's right that like there is this really scary censorship that these big tech companies have become the public square and, and they are censoring the public square and that's not ideal uh and and you know i i prefer uh justice clarence thomas's approach i think i think he's a much more thoughtful constitutional scholar on this. And what, what Justice Thomas said is that we should look at how uh, the government, especially on the left, has been bullying these companies and trying to push them to censor more. Like Zuckerberg didn't want to censor and he, feel like, he felt like he had to because he was told if he didn't, he was going to face regulation from the left, from boys on the left. And I think Thomas says, okay, we could take that. We see what government's doing. We'd actually say, listen, you're not allowed to censor at all anymore. 
because it's a violation of the First Amendment because you're now so powerful the government's pushing you in both ways. And so you've now become effectively so big that we're going to have to apply this First Amendment to you based on how you're being bullied by government. And I think that's a much better framework is forcing them to, they're so big and they're so powerful and they've been tied into this that we're going to have a new precedent for the First Amendment that once you get that big in our society and that powerful, rather than everyone bullying you to do what they want you to do, you just have to follow the Constitution as if you're part of the government at that point. So kind of trying to go through those principles you just outlined, return to the Constitution, school, uh, a Thomas approach saying, okay, you got to you got to make sure you're reflective of you know, free speech in, in, in terms of your policies. What does that what does that actually look like? Uh, do we treat them as that is Facebook, for example, uh, regulate them in, in the way that they're actually. Uh, I, th I think you require full transparency for anything, just for how the algorithms work to ban things, to shadow ban things, to, to send things out. And whenever something is going to get banned or going to get throttled for any reason of content, it has to be shown why, and it can't be for political reasons. And I, th I, th I think I think it's gotten to the point where you basically can't let them censor anything for political reasons anymore. One follow up on that: Wouldn't you say that's what Facebook did by having their outside board review and kind of have that? Uh, yeah, that's not really that's not really true though, because they'll randomly kick people off all the time for for different things. So what'll happen is someone will do say something on the on the political right, and then a bunch of progressive left people will report it, and then they'll kick it off. And every once in a while, yeah, the board might review it, but the, but the fact they're kicking people off for being on the moderate, right? It's, 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 not, it's not enough. Like that, I think there should be a lot more, I think there should be full transparency. If you're, once you're that big, I think you, I think you just, you've lost your, you've lost your right to, to just do things however you want with, 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 it, with it because you, because you're basically becoming something as part of the public square. And it's not, it's not how they fought democracy. I mean, these people purposely try to like shift the presidential election with their power. I think it's, I think, I think that's, I think it's, it's just, and they pretend they didn't, but it's very clear everyone who's in the know knows they did. So it's like you, you, you basically have lost your right to just just be a centered public square. I think you, you is it a function it. of like their size and what they do? Or yeah, I, I, think, I think I think I would tie it but because we've shown the politics in our country, or such the government's going to try to bully any of these platforms. I would tie it to the size and number of people on a consumer platform. So I think it only applies to the very big ones. And once it's a certain size, that's just an extra cost you have around the business is you have to have this like full full audit trail, transparency trail for what you for what you allow and how things get viral and how they don't and who gets banned and it just has to be like a fully audible thing and you have to be forcing the first amendment of free speech that, 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 that that'd be the way i would go about it if, if yeah interesting it, it, but um, where they have been transparent or tried to be or saying that they are transparent let's say with president trump and 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 a ban uh for extending yeah, that, the ban. That, that's one case though there's there's thousands of things they shot up in i'm just saying do you think uh, they did that right was that a process that is sufficiently transparent or not no no i i think they shouldn't be allowed to ban things anymore at all, unless it's like against the law. I think they should have full, and they have to have full transparency. And, and, and in order to do that, you have to have full transparency because they can shadow ban things otherwise. So no, I, I think they should not be allowed. I think they should be, it's a public square and it's free speech and they should not be allowed to ban it at all anymore because they're too powerful. And I think it's completely ridiculous to ban a sitting president. Yeah, a little more discussed there because I think there are folks who worry about hate speech and I, you know, all the, all the stuff that seems to be allowed to re remain on on a Facebook. I mean, I get I get attacked and threatened by the far left all the time. People say, oh, there's going to be a gas leak in your house, like, you know, because they're angry at me for something I said about BLM being Marxist. And that's never banned. That's fine. Right. So so it's it's obvious these things being done in a, in a biased way. And it's basically impossible for it not to be done in a biased way. So, yeah, I think I think hate speech is allowed under the Constitution. And and, and I think there needs you know, be, people can unfollow people if they want. Uh, but if someone wants to follow someone and they want to talk, that should be allowed. And, and, and you know, it's just too dangerous to let these companies censor. So I, I guess I agree with Josh Hawley in his implication of how dangerous this is. Right. I disagree with him in like the method of which he's going about it. You have to go, go about it in a way that, that keeps the constitution functional and it has a legit ruling that's based on the values and the structure of the constitution. But I but I agree with him that we have to go after these these guys. More to discuss on that, obviously, you know, regulating times place and manner, and I'm thinking about society as a whole in terms of just a lot of unhealthy ideas that seem to be held uh, by large segments of the population. Won't well, there, well there's, there's a lot of the, these, these platforms, the way they work uh, by putting everyone together have really polarized things and, and the way they work have increased, I mean, have, you know, the reward increased polarization, the reward increased extreme ideas. And so, so it, it is very scary what they've done to our discourse. Yeah. Uh, we got to leave it there, move into our lightning round to wrap up this great conversation with Joe Lonsdale. Uh, this is where we ask you to share with us your favorite book about President Reagan, your favorite speech by President Reagan, and your favorite quote from President Reagan. Give us all three, two, or just one. What do you have to share? Uh, well, you know, I think his first inaugural address is worth going back and rereading for its optimism, 
and for, for how well he stated his values about, about how special America was and, and what our people mean to the earth. And my favorite, my favorite quote is the one on his tombstone when you go to the library, which yeah. probably people already use. I, but, uh, you know, he said, I know in my heart that man is good, that what is right will always eventually triumph, and there is purpose and worth to every human life. Joe Lonsdale, thank you for being on the show. Bookending Reagan optimism, the start of our podcast and the end. Uh, great way uh, to conclude. We look forward to having you back on the show in the future. Thanks, Roger. I appreciate it. Take care. Thank you for joining us for today's virtual programming event. We hope this conversation has inspired you to share what you've learned with your family and friends and that you'll join us again for an upcoming event. And let me offer lesson number one about America. All great change in America begins at the dinner table. So tomorrow night in the kitchen, I hope the talking begins. And children, if your parents haven't been teaching you what it means to be an American, let them know and nail them on it. That would be a very American thing to do.